In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear fellow redeemed by the blood of Christ. What's your reaction when you hear the phrase, this is new and improved? I suppose you probably have one of two reactions. Either you're excited when you hear the phrase new and improved because you like new things with new features and new uses because you think new is always better. Or when you hear the phrase new and improved, you become skeptical because you like the old thing. You think the old thing is working just fine, and you think the only reason they're coming out with something new is just to get more of your money. Well, today in our text from Isaiah, the Lord says something that's a little shocking to our ears. He says, I am going to do a new thing. And whenever the Lord says he's going to do something new, we shouldn't be skeptical Instead, when the Lord says he's going to do something new, we should get really excited. Why? Well, think about it. If the Lord is doing something new, it's not because the old was imperfect in any way. It's not because something caught the Lord off guard that made the old ir irrelevant. The Lord knows everything. Nothing catches him off guard. Nor is it because the old had some sort of flaw in it. God is perfect. Everything he does is absolutely perfect. And so if the Lord says he's going to do something new, well, it's not really to change the old. Instead, it's to fulfill or to complete or to make perfect the old. That's what the new thing does, and that's remarkable to think about. For look at the old thing that Isaiah references in our text. In the opening words of our text, Isaiah writes, This is what the Lord says, The one who makes a road through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings out the chariots and the horses and the army and the strong warrior. You know what's being referenced there, right? That's the familiar story of the crossing of the Red Sea. And you know that story. The Israelites had just been freed from their slavery in Egypt after the ten plagues. But then Pharaoh quickly changed his mind and gathered up his army and chased after the Israelites, trapping them. For on the one side they had the waters of the Red Sea, and on the other side they had Pharaoh and his army. The situation seemed hopeless. But then the Lord stepped in to do something. He made a way through the sea, as Isaiah said, allowing his people to pass through on dry ground. And then when Pharaoh and his armies tried to follow him, he caused the waters to come crashing down, extinguishing Pharaoh and his army like a wick, as the prophet Isaiah said. You know that story, right? Many people know that story. In fact, if people were to come up with a top 10 list of the greatest things the Lord had ever done, many people would probably include this story of the crossing of the Red Sea. It's why it is so well known. It's just so great and glorious to our eyes to think about God's people passing through on dry ground while those waters came crashing down on Pharaoh and his army. And so isn't it amazing that the prophet Isaiah, after recounting that miraculous story of the crossing of the Red Sea, that great and glorious story that you've probably known since your youth, isn't it amazing that the prophet Isaiah then says these words? He says, do not remember the former things. Don't keep thinking about ancient things. Watch, I am about to do a new thing. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? For if, if the Lord is going to say, forget about the old things like the crossing of the Red Sea. If the Lord is going to say, don't focus on all these old great acts of deliverance in the Old Testament. Then not only must this new thing fulfill and complete and make perfect all these old miracles. But on top of that, 
this new thing's got to be pretty amazing, right? And so what is it? What is this new thing that Isaiah is talking about, this new thing that the Lord is going to do? Well, in our text from Isaiah, Isaiah starts talking about the Lord making a path in the wilderness and sending rivers out into the wasteland. He's talking about how all the wild animals will have water to drink in the desert and how all God's people will sing praises to him forever. That's all picture language. Picture language that can be difficult for us to understand. And so for our purposes, let's actually move to our gospel lesson, to that parable of the wicked tenants, because this parable actually helps explain the new thing the Lord is going to do. It explains what all that picture language at the end of our text from Isaiah about life, it explains what all that picture language means. For you see, the parable is pretty straightforward, isn't it? There's an owner who has a vineyard, and he rents that vineyard to some wicked tenants. And when the time came for the owner to receive his rightful share of the harvest, the wicked tenants beat and shame and wound all the servants, and then they end up killing the son because they don't want to give anything to the owner, not even what is rightfully his. Now, clearly, this is a parable against the wicked Jewish leaders of the time. For they are the ones who rejected God's prophets and would put to death the son, even though the father had given them so much. But it's also a parable spoken against you and me. Because all too often, we close our ears and reject God's prophets. And we also cause the son to die since it was our sins that nailed him to Calvary's cross. You see, when you read this parable, the wicked tenants, don't just think of those nasty Jewish leaders who persecuted Jesus. But see yourself. <laughs> see that it was your sins that forced the Son of God to die. But amid all that law in this parable, which Jesus spoke the Tuesday of Holy Week, right before his suffering and death, amid all that law, did you catch the beautiful gospel in it? For after the people say, may this never be, may we not act so wicked, may we not have this land taken from us, listen to what Jesus said. He said, then what about this that is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And those are beautiful words. Words that actually clearly describe what this new thing the Lord is going to do. Words that help us understand all of that picture language at the end of Isaiah about life. For think about these words. The stone the builders rejected had become the capstone, the cornerstone. First off, notice the stone had to be rejected. This is Jesus, the Son of God, being rejected and put to death by the chief priest and teachers of the law. For the chief priests and teachers of the law hated Jesus. They didn't like what Jesus was doing. They didn't like the message that he was proclaiming. And so the chief priests and teachers of the law thought, well, if we can reject him and put him to death, then we'll get rid of him and we'll never have to hear from him again. But that's not really what happened. <laughs> Remember, the Lord was going to do a new thing, something that was great and glorious. And so he took the stone that was rejected, Jesus, and he made him the cornerstone. For you see, it was through the rejection and the killing of the Son of God that he would give such wonderful blessings to you, his children. For it was through the rejection and the killing of the Son of God at the hand of wicked men that he forgave your sins, my sins, and the sins of the entire world. That's the meaning of the phrase, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And that's really the new thing that Isaiah was prophesying about in our text. It's that the Son of God would be rejected and killed at the hands of wicked men. 
all so that he can be the foundation of our faith, the one who wins for us forgiveness, life, and salvation. And that's amazing to think about. For let's think about a builder just for a second. When a builder chooses a cornerstone, he chooses it very carefully, right? For the cornerstone is the stone on which the entire building rests upon. And so if the cornerstone is faulty or deformed in any way, it would probably make the rest of the building faulty and deformed as well. It's why no builder would choose a stone that had cracks in it or that wasn't perfect. It's why no builder would choose a stone that had previously been rejected by another builder. But this is exactly what the Lord did. He took the one who was rejected by the chief priests and teachers of the law, the one who was betrayed by one of his closest friends, the one who was hung with the worst criminals of the day, the one who was put to death in a bloody and gory way of crucifixion. The Lord took him and made him the foundation of everything that we do the foundation of our church, the foundation of our faith, for it is only by his rejection and killing that we have been forgiven of all our sins. And once we are forgiven of all our sins, as all of us are, then? Well, then you don't need to worry about death. Because you see, death only comes to sinners. And so if you have been forgiven of all your sins, you don't need to worry about death, but you can be certain that you are going to live forever. Not in this world, and who would want to live forever in this sinful world anyways? But you will live forever in the glorious realms of heaven. That's what all that picture language about life, about rivers in the desert and all the ostriches and people having water to drink, that's what all that picture language symbolizes. It's symbolizing the perfect, eternal life of heaven. Do you see why the new thing the Lord is going to do is have his son rejected and killed at the hands of wicked men? For while we would expect this new thing to be something great and glorious like the crossing of the Red Sea, that's something great and glorious to our eyes. The Lord had different plans. The new thing he was prophesying about is having his son rejected and killed because this, this is what causes you and me and all of God's people to live forever. You see, while that story, the crossing of the Red Sea is great and it spared those people from death, it only spared them from death for a time. They're not living right now. In fact, most of the people who crossed through the dry ground of the Red Sea, they died in the wilderness. They didn't even make it to the promised land of Canaan. But when the Lord does the new thing of having his son rejected and killed by wicked men, that gives you and me and everyone else who is built on him, it gives us life that will last forever. Do you see why this new thing is actually greater than all the old things the Lord did? Do you see how this new thing fulfills and completes and makes perfect all the old acts of deliverance that the Lord brought to his people throughout the Old Testament? It's neat to see that, isn't it? And this is why whenever in the Old Testament the Lord says, we're going to do a new thing, or we're going to sing a new song, or I'm going to make a new covenant, anytime in the Old Testament the Lord is talking about something new, we can't help but get really excited. Because whenever he's talking about this new thing, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the work that Jesus did, the work that gives life forever. He's talking about that quote from Jesus. The stone the builders rejected. Jesus, he is now the cornerstone. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please rise as we confess the one true faith using the words of the nice.